How's it going, eh? I can't do it. I'm not Canadian. But I do love Celine Dion, especially her early stuff, you know, back when she collaborated with uh, Chris Cornell. I love Uncle Joey. My husband loves hockey, although he's a fan of uh, the LA Kings. I like Canadian bacon. I used to watch Trailer Park Boys back in 2010 when I first thought I discovered this genius reality show, but um, I grew up since then, I guess, and it's too hard for me to hear the GD word over and over, so can't watch it anymore. No, I'm saying, but uh, I'm a housewife, a uh, homeschooling mom of five, and a fan of Street Carnage, and you guys and kind of inspired me to make this video about my family history, so um, I hope you enjoy it and share it. Thank you. This Memorial Day, I reflected on my amazing heritage. It is one that I'll probably never be able to learn more about, and in fact may forget or lose the pieces I've been lucky enough to have. And so here I am attempting to immortalize the memory of my heroic ancestors. For myself, my kids, and for anyone who may need reminding of true American exceptionalism. Like this guy, President Obama. My name is Samantha. This is my mom, Jane. This is her dad, my grandfather, Norman. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy at age 20 and became a radioman and eventually a chief warrant officer. During World War II, he was stationed in Corregidor, and when the Japanese invaded the Philippines, he was captured. He was tortured, starved, worked to the bone, and nearly died of dysentery but for his fellow captive soldiers keeping him alive. He survived four years of this abuse, waiting for rescue, all the while being brutally transported from torture camp to torture camp, even on the hell ships. These are the camps I've been able to find him on the roster for having been held. Most prisoners were transported to other concentration camps in Japan on ships where they were packed like sardines in the bottom with room only enough to stand, although they could barely do that at the time as most of the men were badly injured or ill and malnourished to skin and bones. Keep in mind that they were never given any bathroom facilities other than a bucket or holes they dug in the ground at camps, which were always covered in flies carrying malaria. While in Japan, the prisoners were forced to do labor at various places, including coal mines and Japanese factories. They were forced to live in heavily targeted areas, another violation of the G Geneva Convention, which toward the end resulted in American planes bombing American prisoners of war. If anyone attempted to escape, they were not only tortured and killed and buried in a, a grave they dug themselves, but many innocent what were called blood brothers were also killed to discourage future attempts. If you want to know more about what this cheery bunch did, look up the Breitbart article on the lesson on moral equivalence. It's tough to read. He was rescued four years later in 1945 after the Japanese surrender, but as this book, Bataan Death March, A Soldier's Story, says, it took months to finally rescue everyone, and many sadly died on the way home. Norman stayed in the U.S. Navy after his recovery. This is a picture of him with his crew on the USS Norton Sound in 1949. Shortly after that, he met my grandma, Betty, and married in 1955. He was awarded a Bronze Star and Silver Star for his service in World War II. He died in his sleep the year I was born, 1984. <clears throat> this is my dad, James. This is his mom, my grandmother, Mary. Mary moved from Hawaii to the Philippines just before the war had started. She was also captured by the Japanese and held in a prisoner of war camp. She was raped by Japanese guards and conceived my dad. When she was released in 1943, many Filipinos were set free years before the Americans, she gave birth to my dad on the ship leaving the Philippines headed for Hawaii, where my dad would be raised by his mom and stepdad. I learned about all this through my brother Reggie from my dad's first marriage. He's done a lot of genealogy research on the family, and our dad passed away in 2005. I remember six years ago, my husband and I took a road trip from Williamsburg, Virginia, where we lived, where my husband was stationed in the Navy as a nuclear electrician, to California to visit family, and we stopped in a few places on the way um, just to have fun and explore different things off, off the side of the freeways. And uh, we stopped in New Mexico to check out a nuclear science museum. And it was a creepy place that had displays that still emit radioactive energy. It was filled with memorabilia and crazy propaganda from all sides of World War II. And I believe it had replicas of the atomic bomb. Well, there was a guest book that asked for your thoughts regarding Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I remember writing in support of the bombings and making a snide remark about good old President Obama and his lack of balls. Although now I know it's not about ballage for him because he genuinely thinks America is evil. 
and let's dispel with the notion that Obama doesn't know what he's doing. Anyhow, I've grown in my faith a lot since then and am somewhat conflicted about the bombings. It really seems like there was no way to stop the Japanese, especially when their citizenry grew up in a culture that honored Imperial Japan as their god. Their ideology was so deeply embedded, similar to radical Islam. Kamikazes were the original suicide bombers. While it's hard to reconcile the pain, death, and damage many innocent Japanese suffered with my faith in Jesus' teachings, I know the alternative would mean my mom and dad may not have existed, and I would not exist. My kids would not exist. And if you existed, you probably would be speaking German or Japanese or Germanese. With an enemy so far gone that they're willing to die just to save face or harm innocent people, and I don't just mean Western prisoners of war, the Japanese killed nearly 6 million Chinese, Indonesians, Korean, Indo-Chinese, and Filipino, including women and children. Obviously disregarding any rules of war, how do you fight that honorably? Other than with prayer for conversion, I don't know. You know, I look at the amazing stories of sacrifice and integrity of the past. My husband's grandmother came here from Italy, Italy after having just seen Mussolini parade her streets at age 18, just before we were involved in the war. And she learned English and worked her whole life to raise a family and attain the American dream. My grandfather enlisted in the U.S. Navy at 20 years of age and served 24 years, four of which were in, a barbaric, in barbaric captivity. What are young people doing today? And you know you're old when you start saying young people. They're glomming on to as many pseudo-issues as they can to feel worthy of the comforts we Americans enjoy. Robert Bork said one of the most underrated emotions is boredom. I believe this boredom begets not merely moral relativism, but an abhorrence to anything considered good or wholesome as out of style or obsolete. It's way more cultured and fashionable to flip everything backward and confuse the hell out of everyone while unwittingly destroying liberty. G.K. Chesterton hit the nail on the head way back in 1905 when he said, Every one of the popular modern phrases and ideals is a dodge in order to shirk the problem of what is good. We are fond of talking about liberty. That, as we talk of it, is a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. We are fond of talking about progress. That is a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. We are fond of talking about education. That is a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. The modern man says, let us leave all these arbitrary standards and embrace liberty. This is logically rendered, let us not decide what is good, but let it be considered good not to decide it. He says, away with your old moral formula. I am for progress. This logically stated means, let us not settle what is good, but let us settle whether we are good at getting more of it. He says, neither in religion nor moral morality, my friend, lie the hopes of the race, but in education. This clearly expressed means, we cannot decide what is good, but let us give it to our children. I love that quote. Am I just idealizing things? Does every generation look at the suffering in previous generations and feel embarrassed at their own measly plight? When my kids have kids, will that generation admire us for the integrity it took to protest zoos? to inject isms and phobias creating fictional victims in every story, for bitching for safe spaces on college campuses to protect us from free thought and stifle free speech, for avoiding GMOs, for having too many crappy kids shows on your Netflix, for pretending like we don't know what bathroom to use. Look at this. You can poop here if you're a woman, a man, a man-spreading woman, a person with a nose sticking out of their left side, a person who likes to hop on one foot, a slow rolling wheelchairist and a I ain't got no time speed demon, demon wheelchairist. I hope that list does not define our time. The heroes of every generation's past are the people that fight evil. My hope is that my grandchildren's generation can look back and be thankful that we saw evil for what it was and fought it, that our prayers along with the prayers of those martyred for their Christian beliefs around the world today helped to convert many souls to Christianity that we successfully expose the abortion industry's lies and the ardently pro-choice have a change of heart and see pregnancy as the gift from God that it is. I hope that we'd have quelled the onslaught of social justice warriors that find offense with American patriotism while benefiting from American exceptionalism. I sure hope by that time we'll have removed the victim goggles. Be grateful for your country and those that protect it. Be respectful. Be courageous. Love God and your neighbor. Now, no patriotic argument, especially referring to World War II, would be complete without a Hitler reference. I want to share this very telling quote of what his 
of his that I recently read in a biography on German Christian martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas. This is what Hitler said. It's been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regards sacrifice for the fatherland as the highest good? The Mohammedan religion too would have been much more compatible to us than Christianity. Why did it have to be Christianity with its meekness and flabbiness? That quote spoke to me deeply, inflaming my heart with love for the cross. And yet we let liberals call us the Nazis? I know I'll be attacked for having misgivings about Truman's difficult decision despite being glad that it ended a brutal war and thereby permitted my existence. But that's what makes Americans great, is that we have consciences and don't get off on inflicting harm. And you know why having a conscience and fighting injustice and correcting our mistakes is so representative of American culture? You guessed it, because our country was founded on Christian principles. Regardless of those that pretend to be atheist, you have a formed, developed conscience because of your American Christian heritage. I'm going to end this with a powerful quote from 28-year-old martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer. There is no way to peace along the way of safety, for peace must be dared. It is itself the great venture and can never be safe. Peace is the opposite of security. To demand guarantees is, is to want to protect oneself. Peace means giving oneself completely to God's commandment, wanting no security, but in faith and obedience, laying the destiny of the nations in the hand of Almighty God, not trying to direct it for selfish purposes. Battles are won not with weapons, but with God. They are won when the way leads to the cross. Thank you for watching, and God bless.